You're listening to the Quality Speak Weekly podcast. 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 Trump and his uh, speeches that he's had the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, first, in regards to the CPAC speech that he gave, um, which to me is a little is is interesting. In the CPAC convention, we talked a little bit about how it came to be and what it was about uh, last week. And if you watched or listened to the bit we had, was uh, calling it conservative Comic Con essentially. But what's funny is that in 2016, CPAC was the place where the Never Trump uh, thing kind of reached ahead. Uh, that's where the Never Trump hashtag came in, and that's when the hysteria of the Republican nomination raged. I mean, there was this concerted anti-Trump movement there, and now, a year later, he shows up at CPAC, and he is, is loved and praised. And one funny thing from the convention is that there was someone there handing out flags with, with the Trump logo on them. Right, the little flags you get, like the little American flags and, you know, these little hand waver things. But they were handing out these Trump flags. And people were waving them by in by the dozens and dozens. And then all of a sudden, they all got taken away. And they all got taken away because the flags that had the Trump gold emblazoned on them were actually very small Russian flags. <laughs> and they were handing them out to these CPAC convention. People you would think would assume would, would know... Uh, what the Russian flag was, or at least have a hint that this isn't his logo and this isn't the American colors the, kind of in the right way. Um, so there were dozens and dozens of little flags that had Trump on them with Russia. So, I mean, this Russia thing does not, uh, they cannot leave uh, the Trump administration. But that said, he had a very good showing at, at CPAC from those people there, even though there weren't the huge lines five blocks long, as he claimed. Um but the the conservatives are more unified this year than they were last year when that Never Trump movement was coming around. And the CPAC straw poll from this year uh, showed that Donald Trump enjoys an 86% approval rating from the assembled conservatives. Those are pretty good numbers. Um, but that does show that there is a little wiggle room in some, some of those Republicans that are still there. Um, and, you know, whatever you may say, Trump has already changed D.C., uh, by just being there and doing what he's doing. Now you can say whether that's positive or whether that's negative, that's still left, you know, up in the air. But people, at least in the CPAC convention, uh, are seeing that. Uh, and the country as a whole um, is an interesting mesh. But with CPAC, it's a little bit different than any other convention or situation. 94% of the CPAC attendees uh, support the selection of Neil Gorsh. Uh, the 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 person up for um the supreme court whose name i always butcher and i do apologize um and we talked about him and how he is a seems like a decent human being so that number is fine uh 86 percent oppose any republican senators who oppose his nomination fine of course uh and 75 percent believe if filibustered the senate would go nuclear whatever that means so this whole supreme court thing they're pretty unified on what they're not unified on, of course, as we're starting to find out this week, is Obamacare and its replacement. Um, because this morning, I don't know if Nate was was paying attention, but on Twitter, uh, Rand Paul was lighting up Twitter like a crazy person, running around from department to department trying to find the hidden uh, Obamacare replacement that the Republicans have been uh, filtering from place to place and secret location to secret location. And then once Rand Paul found it and wanted to read it and make it public like it should be, uh, was turned away by staffers and police that were there. He even brought himself a photocopier uh, because they said he wasn't allowed to take it with him or to see it. So he pulled a big photocopier with him as a show that, well, he'll just make some copies. Um, so there's that going on so there is some wiggle room, but of course at CPAC you're not going to see that. These are the hardened people that are there um, together. Now conservative, the GOP should not confuse conservative support with obedience. Um, these are the most ardent supporters, like I said. So some of that is going to be uh, interesting to see how it comes out, especially with this healthcare stuff. But other than that, I mean, his speech was was pretty Donald Trump. Um 
feeding off that sort of praise. I mean, what did you think of, of the little that you saw uh, regarding his CPAC speech? Well, I watched most of it. I, I, I would say, too, that I mean, when, when, when you know rightly that, you know, 86 percent of CPAC attendees support Trump, that's roughly in line with Republican approval. I mean, I think his approval rating with Republicans is somewhere in the ballpark of like 89 percent, I think, nationally. We'll, we'll see how that plays out, obviously, in the next couple of months. But that's part of what we're here for. Um, his speech was striking to me that, and especially as we'll get into his address to Congress shortly, because it does seem appropriate to end the show on Trump. Um, he talked for over, I mean, I think roughly about 12 minutes or more before he got into anything like policy. I mean, he spent so, I mean, it's just amazing to have someone like him who is the opposite of an ideologue speaking to a bunch of ideologues. I mean, he spent the first 10 minutes or more was all about just like everything is, is about Trump. There were, it, it was about Trump. It was about his vendettas. It was about his pettiness. It was about his ego. There was nothing really in the way of actual kind of conservative philosophy, economic policy, sort of wonky sort of analysis. There was nothing like there was nothing like that at all. And he eventually got more into it. But really as as you're we saying there is that divide between him and some elements of the conservative movement. But it's blurring. And overall, I mean, even David Brooks, who's, you know, kind of your typical, uh, probably on the most left flank of the Republican world at this point, writing for, for the New York Times and all that, and he was never Trump. But even he's saying now, I, I, mean, I saw him with Mark Shields on PBS the other day saying that he, I mean, the Republican Party now is basically this white ethno-nationalist outfit, uh, and and that's what CPAC represents. That someone like Trump, who is so, in so many ways, just instinctively and morally opposed to what a lot of conservatism stands for, um, can be can be there, and as you said, I mean, can can be met with rapturous applause. I mean, he was a huge hit at CPAC. And I think I think the CPAC, what I got from it, at least this year, is CPAC has always kind of been a place where I think the libertarian portion of the Republican Party can kind of go to to kind of get their message out. And I think this year and the CPAC convention in particular has essentially killed the libertarian party, uh, at least that faction like the Rand Pauls that are in there. Uh, and we talked about it last week about the Rand Paul photo ops and stuff with his cutouts. Um yeah. Is is essentially dead because the things that he was proclaiming when he finally did get into a little bit of substance um, is absolutely against the free market and free trade. Something that that libertarian wing is very, very like strongly behind, and it's a different group. And a lot of that could be because Donald Trump was there to speak, and a lot of that could be that this is you know his supporters showing up to the CPAC. Um, but I know I it's it's an interesting place to be, and so many libertarians are are kind of lost to figure out where they're going to be and what's going to happen because the more and more the support they showed early on, and now when he's actually coming out and saying things, it's very anti their position, um, especially with regards to what we know so far about the new Obamacare replacement. Which is act, and we talked about this a little bit. Nate went into this a couple podcasts ago about them potentially wanting a voucher program and stuff, which is essentially uh, what some of the old Never Trump movement is getting behind. Uh, Ted Cruz came out, I believe, this morning saying he would not support a voucher program in any way, uh, simply because that. And Rand Paul, I think, uh, came out and said the same thing, because a voucher program and essentially would be another entitlement program, which is the opposite of what. Uh, they want when you say we want less government and less involvement. Well, now the only thing you're doing is creating a new entitlement program and, you know, new money and budgets and all this stuff. You're actually making the problem bigger. So I think we won't really see the Republicans figure out where they stand. <clears throat> Excuse me. They won't really figure out where they stand for another couple months, especially when we get a little bit closer to the midterm cycle uh, to see 
how things pan out because I think one of the the big things that is going to resonate, I think, most with the voters. I honestly don't think this. I think this Russia thing is incredibly vitally important um, as policy and as a, a sovereignty kind of standpoint. But I think the average American, more so maybe in the Midwest area, it doesn't affect them at all. But what it's where it is going to hit them most is how this healthcare plan is crafted because if it starts affecting them even in the slightest they are going to turn tail and run from this um and we can already kind of see some people going hey i hope to god better not lose my stuff and i'm already seeing some conservative outlets even even places like fox news this afternoon i was watching um o'reilly because i i watch you know i try to take everything in from everyone um and he had vice president pence on and O'Reilly over and over again was trying to hit him with, okay, that's fine that we're having a repeal and replace, whatever, but what are you doing? What can you tell me? Can you give me any details? Can you give me any numbers? And over and over again, he got nothing. He's like, well, we'll talk about it. It's coming. And at the end, he just, even O'Reilly himself was just like, so what you're telling me is we'll have to wait and see. We've got nothing right now. And I think a lot of the administration kind of standpoint for a lot of issues is, it's coming. It'll get there. Don't worry. And they don't ever really go into details because I can't pull any details right now from what Trump really wants to do aside from signing executive orders and then getting the big ones reversed by the courts. So we don't really know what they want to do. And I think Republicans right now, at least the there's a the contingent there that isn't unsure of Trump is kind of playing a wait and see game to see what he does does before kind of coming to terms with or standing with united with the party or not because i think this health care thing might be the the straw that breaks the camel's back for a lot of them the issue is on health care is what trump is talking about I and mean, what he's promising and, and pence and all these other kind of sycophants and hacks are are, are touting on his behalf is something that's just impossible and, and matt iglesias and, and vox had a had a great piece on this pretty recently which is the basically the the dilemma for republicans is that what they want is a repeal of the affordable care act which will give a big tax cut to people at the top because it was financed disproportionately on these kind of on, on the upper income of the ladder and investment income and all that and less care i mean what what the republican agenda means is However, they reshape the healthcare system; it will deliver less. It will have fewer benefits. I mean, fun- fundamentally, the Republican vision of healthcare is low premiums, low, low low payments every month in exchange for very high deductibles. And and everything Republicans talk about basically means steps in that direction and tax credits and things that help people pay for these really stingy plans. Now, all that's great if you you know, make more than, you know, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars a year, whatever it is, and and you can afford to pay a a six, a seven, a ten thousand dollar deductible or whatever it would be when when the time comes. But for the ordinary person, that that system is not going to work very well. And that's the dilemma Republicans are in is and, and that's why Donald Trump when, when he talks about health care, it's just so nonsensical. And we're move on we'll move on to the to the address he he made to Congress this week. But everything he said in there, it was, it's like the, the equivalent of some, someone saying that they have this great plan where you're going to eat more dessert and you're really not going to cut back on any meals. You might even eat a, a, a fourth or fifth meal and you're not going to increase your exercise and you're going to play more video games. You just go down the list, but you're you know, you're going to lose a lot of weight and you're going to be in the best shape of your life. And then that's what that's the snake oil that Trump is selling. There's just there's no way to do in any conceivable way, what he's talking about with healthcare, which is just this please everyone agenda. Well, that's impossible. I mean, they're, they're going to be with any policy. They're going to be winners and losers to some degree. And, and there's no way that, I mean, there's no way that you can organize a healthcare policy that just affects everyone equally or benignly. I mean, it's, it's going to be financed by either slightly higher premiums on healthy people and the young and forcing them to participate, or it's going to be 
done by block granting Medicaid and cutting a lot of lower income people and seniors off of care. There's no way that you can, I mean, even if you did the, the kind of the Bernie Sanders preferred route and, and Bernie Sanders actually had a, a pretty spirited rebuttal to Trump's uh, address this week, where he talked about, again, as he had in that debate with Cruz, how we, what we really need to be doing is moving towards a kind of guaranteed universal health care single payer system. But even, even if that was the case, even if we implemented single payer, that would mean some people would start to pay much higher taxes. And that would mean hospitals and doctors would start to accept some pretty steep cuts in some areas. I mean, there's just no way that you can make everyone happy with a policy and least of all health care, which contrary to what Donald Trump and all his mass ignorance thought it's not it, – it's basically the most complicated policy you can get. I mean education is kind of complicated. You can run through a lot of things. I mean, maybe energy is a little simpler. You know, you just reduce carbon output sort of thing. I mean there, there are a lot of other policy areas where you, you, you have a clear view of what needs to be done. But healthcare is just – I mean, it's the human body. It's the human system. It's either something that that God gave us or it's something and or it's something that evolution has worked out for billions of years. And there's just there's no way that you could simply create solutions for this. I mean, the the human body, the, the human medical condition is all extremely complex and so is the economy if you when you combine the two as as we do because we don't have just guaranteed free health care it's it's really complicated there's a lot that goes into it and there's no way you can please all yeah it's it's a situation where someone's always going to lose and i mean the last time that that republicans the last couple of times that they tried to deal with this uh it ended up biting them in the ass uh, but from then we we move on a little bit into his next uh speech which this one is is addressed to congress much different than a cpac speech and to be fair donald trump gave a decent speech uh before congress now let me be clear that it was not um as some pundits on the right were saying one of his one of the greatest speeches delivered and a lot a lot of people were out uh referring to like comparing him to reagan and these led you know these legendary talkers and i'm like Okay, guys, calm down. That's complete bullshit. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of Reagan and and a lot of what he did, but let's not put Donald Trump in the same position as as Ronald Reagan as an orator, at least at that. Um, But, and I was reading this uh, earlier today, and it was a good question. When people give great speeches, uh, as a lot of people on the right and a lot of commentators were saying that this was a great speech, um, there's usually lines and, and and things that you can recall them saying, and you can go back to great speeches from Lincoln and Kennedy and and uh, even Reagan um, had great speeches where you can pull a line that sticks with you for years and years that you can call back to. So take this test, those listening, and I'll ask Nate too, uh, can you remember a single, like, statement or line from that speech now that we're removed from it for a day or so like is there just one line not a moment not a situation but like a line that he delivered that you can remember because i watched the speech and i watched clips uh several times to get ready you know for our talk about it and i can't i can't recall one statement that he made and to me that indicates that it wasn't a great speech now i'm not saying it wasn't good i thought it was good but I think the right is exploding this to put him on the level of of Reagan and you know Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall when this speech was like he he was medicated and he wasn't adequately speaking to a a speech and not going off the cuff. Thankfully, I actually do thank him for having something prepared and reading it at least in Congress. <laughs> It, it was a stark comment, especially just having spoken about the CPAC speech, which was the, the preceding Friday. I mean, it yeah, it was just a lot more polished. He didn't spend he didn't spend his time on enemies and, and the usual kind of Trumpisms that he does. And it was it was kind of one of those things where there was something about the speech, and I think it was just a lot. I, no, I, I don't remember a specific line. I remember a moment about it that I'm, I'm going to discuss in a moment, but. I don't remember a specific line, but I think that's 
kind of not completely uncommon. And I, I don't know how many great one-liners these usually give. I mean, I, you think of like Bill Clinton, the era of big government is over. You think of George Bush, axis of evil. I and mean, there, there's just – there's there's a couple, but for the most part, they don't really stand out. I mean, I think there was like a lot of ham-fisted imagery and stuff. And I think you actually look at the speech, and we're just talking about such dramatically reduced expectations for Trump. I mean, if anyone else had given this speech, it wouldn't have been noteworthy at all. And you might have even said, actually, he didn't do that good a job of delivering. But because Trump is just such just this this vulgar orangutan. I mean, then anything he does to like actually stay focused and and stay on point and, and and read without seeming like especially vindictive as he did that night gets him all these plaudits. But if you're actually, you know, politics isn't just about you know political analysis shouldn't just be about this kind of theatrics and just kind of grading something like a theater critic or someone you know measuring goals like like you're observing sports or something like you should actually to some degree be assessing what he was saying and as we're as, as we were noting earlier what he said about healthcare on that which is that they're allegedly so close to rolling out a proposal and yet he has nothing but these vague generalities and these these impossible objectives to all square uh, on, on so many other things, what, what he was saying, I mean, he, he sticks to his, his really simplistic talking points about international trade. He used a ridiculous stat about 94 million Americans, the injustice of them being out of the labor force, even though that, you know, that counts everyone outside of the labor force over a certain age. And as baby boomers retire, that number is just going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, he said that American companies are overtaxed. Now, it's it's very true that statutorily we have one of the highest tax rates on business income in the world. It's not true that as an actual percentage of our GDP, it's high at all. In fact, American companies pay a lot less than they used to as a percentage. Now, there are fair arguments about how much they should be paying anyway, and should we be taxing business income? Maybe we should just tax shareholders, or maybe we should just pass a consumption tax. There, It's more complicated than he let on, but you just go down through the list and everything. I mean, he, on on, on Obamacare, which is this great disaster, he quoted Matt Bevan, the far-right Tea Party governor of Kentucky, who said that you know it's a disaster in his state or whatever. Well, Matt Bevan isn't some independent analyst or policy wonk. Of course, he's going to say Obamacare is a disaster. I mean, that's just meaningless. Like, of course, he disapproves of of the bill. He he had, I think, most offensively, he had this the. The, the bereaved of people who have died from what he calls illegal alien, illegal immigrant violence. I, I think that's a very offensive spectacle. I mean, you just go down the line. I mean, the most offensive moment I thought by far, which has been very divisive, and it seems like seems like veterans have been more disproving than pundits who I. I think are shamefully falling for this when he called out the soldier Ryan who died in that raid in Yemen, which that he still hasn't taken uh, responsibility for. Yeah. And which is still much like his dealings with Russia, just this kind of cloudy, murky ball of mystery. We, we don't know why there were these ground troops committed in Yemen. We, we don't know why he hastily signed off on this without doing anything. over dinner. Yeah. Without, and, and really just wasn't involved at all. And he got, he got an American soldier killed potentially. I mean, he could very, convincingly make the case that it was Donald Trump's negligence in signing off on this mission, or at least morally, even if you, even if you say like Donald Trump is that, you know, this is the fault of the military, which seems to me to be a very stupid thing to say, he still signed off on this. And so it's, it's, it's a, yeah, I mean, most, most presidents, when, when something goes bad and they get foobard out there, they at least take responsibility on their shoulders, um, past presidents right and left when something goes wrong um at least at a base level saying i authorize this you know we'll we got to figure things out and move on but you know i i'll take responsibility for this he refuses just simply refuses
Yeah, and I I thought it was absolutely appalling that he had Sean Spicer uh, saying something to the effect of, "Well, the, the, you know, he he knew the soldier knew what he was signing up for when he did it." That I think that's actually I thought I thought that was a really appalling sentiment. I mean that 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 sounds like apologia for their own asses. That doesn't sound like owning up to anything. It's not something they have to say. So he had that moment there. Where, where he was honoring this deceased soldier, and he, and he said something. I'm looking at the quote right now. Obviously, I don't remember verbatim, but he said, and Ryan is looking down right now. You know that. And he's very happy because I think he just broke a record. For as the Bible teaches us, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Ryan. He Ryan, was. Uh... God, he yeah, was so Ryan close. Laid, yeah, Ryan laid down his life for his friends, for his country, and for our freedom. We will not forget him. Now, that turned out to be this. Now, he was so close. Be- he was so close to being just so on the money, and then he had to throw in that little tiny bit that just makes him seem like a gigantic well, yeah, asshole. Yeah, no, it, what, what it makes him seem like is what he has so often seen like, which is a sociopathic monster. I I, I think it, Michelle Goldberg, who writes for Slate, who's a great columnist, had, I think, the most accurate dissection of his speech in that moment. And as she summarized really what that moment was for Trump when he had lived that line about Ryan, uh was that basically Owen's death, uh, Ryan Owen's death, had a happy ending because a lot of people, quote, clapped at Trump's big speech. That's what he reduced this soldier's life to as his crying widow was there. I thought it was absolutely disgusting, and I got angrier and more disgusted the more I thought about it because – Again, Goldberg's right. This this death didn't mean anything to him other than an applause line in a speech. Now, really, the 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 chilling corollary of that is what do any of our lives mean to Donald Trump? What is Donald Trump capable of feeling? I would argue, based on what we've seen, he's not capable of feeling sorrow, regret, empathy self-reflection. He is a sociopath. I mean, we're talking about a man who on 9-11 bragged that his building had returned to its status or become the tallest building in New York. Again, that is an absolutely shameful. And I think this just continues that. Like, what do our lives mean to him? I, I think there are grounds to think, as unsettling as it is, that he might not even lose. I mean, if the worst happened... If his security apparatus fails and some terrible event happens, which God forbid, will Trump feel the kind of the the the, the, the pity, the the sorrow, the the guilt that we would think most other people and most previous presidents would have been able to feel and would have felt and acted on? I can't say with certainty that he would, and I just I, the, the more. You dwell on that moment, the, the 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 more shocking and horrifying it is. I mean, we've literally put one of the worst people we possibly can in charge of our country. I mean, this this is a man with no feeling other than self gratification and ego. Well, that's that's what he reduced that moment to. What are his his incentives to not get other people killed and because pundits have fallen for this. I mean, even Van Jones on CNN was saying, was, was holding that moment up as the moment where Donald Trump became our president without question. I think there is question. There is doubt. I think that is a terrible moment. And I think Americans should be enraged about it. No, I, I, most of the military friends I have and a lot of on Twitter, wives of Navy SEALs now retired. I have uh, Twitter messages of them. Uh, embarrassed by how this was used. Now, presidents have used uh, uh, those in military um, kind of for political gain in the past, I think done by everyone. I mean, a lot of people were pointing to the Khan family uh, during uh, Hillary Clinton's speech. But one of the issues that uh, that I had uh, most about this was that this was just a few weeks old. Um, so this is not a, a situation that has been investigated and, and gone up and down and we know what we got from it. I mean, this is just something that literally just happened. And what actually made me more angry than anything now that I'm kind of processing all this information is how the conservative media handled this situation today, um, calling anyone 
that disagreed with this uh, disgusting and hateful and vindictive and evil. And there was some, some really aggressive things. But what you have to understand for everyone listening here is that this Navy SEAL has a father, a father who refused to meet with Trump, a father who demands an investigation, a father that wants to know what the hell happened, what his son died for, and wants answers. So when when you have these conservative media outlets coming out and calling people against this uh, this uh, kind of prop and, and what he did and what he said there as disgusting evil with no morals and heartless, what they're doing is they're attacking one uh, uh, member of his family. They're attacking his father because his father is in that same position. And that's one of the the situations that I had serious concerns with with if you're going to and which is why i don't think the Khan family even comes into play here because they were both there with um uh, at that speech when they were there for hillary clinton is that one the father of this navy seal does not agree with what is going on and how it's being handled so to say that anyone that disagrees with this moment or situation is in the wrong or evil is lumping that very Navy SEAL's father into that group, that very person that we need to respect and we need to hold up and, and that we it was a hero and, and all this and got the standing ovation, whatever you want to call it, now you're lumping his father into that. And to me, that was morally reprehensible on just another level. Um, just, I don't know, just how long does, does one have to wait for a situation before you can kind of prop someone up as, as a political tool, that's a whole nother conversation that I'm sure we could dive into for hours on a time. Um, but I mean, when you don't have the mother and father of this child in conjunction there side by side, and then to use one of them essentially against the other, that to me was just a whole painful experience on another level that maybe, I don't know if anyone can understand that. And maybe you have to come from a situation where you only have one parent or something. But to me, and then hear the media kind of lump him into the situation just kind of kind of got me a little a little too much. Yeah, it, it, it was terrible. But the, the speech was well received. It was obviously my sentiment is not a majoritarian sentiment. I don't even know how much that moment stuck out with everyone else. But like I said, I, I feel I feel like that gets more sinister the more I think about it. So I think this I, I think what's horrifying about that address is that Donald Trump does the bare ass minimum and is held up as being presidential. And I think it just shows how people can fall for his whole deal. And I, I mean, I think people who are banking on Donald Trump just completely imploding or getting impeached. You know, it, it might be too sanguine. It, it that, that might not be as plausible as we hope. I mean, I, when I say implode, I, I certainly don't want him to Im, implode by any ill falling on any fellow Americans or any anyone else in the world. But, I mean, I implode in terms of his own kind of administrative incompetence and all that. I, we don't know that that's going to happen. I mean, they, they are sloppy as hell, and we, we, we discussed already just how bad they are at so many things. But we don't know if that's... It's actually going to certainly not in the next couple of years where Republicans are still in charge and likely will be. I mean, 2018, I mean, we, we should we should mention at, at some point before we end about the Democrats response to this, which which got a lot of kind of raised eyebrows that Democrats went with uh, Bashir, this former he's not even a current governor of Kentucky who delivered a, a 10 minute address in the middle of this diner in his state. And it was kind of this odd image of this old white guy surrounded by what seemed to be an all white room. And a lot of people thought, well, you know, why didn't they put up Maxine Waters? Why didn't they put up all these rising stars in the party? And I think they actually did the right thing. And this ties into 2018, which is basically the 2018 map. And there'll be ample more time to talk about this on several subsequent broadcasts. But suffice to say for now, it's something bordering on a hellscape for Democrats. It's going to be very – unless Donald Trump – really, really bottoms out and becomes so unpopular like Bush subsequent 2006, it's going to be very tough for Democrats that that year, uh, that, that election cycle, I think. And 
it's certainly the case that Democrats don't need white voters to win the, the, the presidency. It's often forgotten, of course, that Obama actually lost the white vote both times and still won fairly decisively. So that's true. And Democrats shouldn't try and pander overall as a national strategy to white voters to win them back because it's kind of a fool's errand. But it is true that for some of these state races, they are going to need some more whites. They are going to need to convince some of the white voters who flipped over for Trump or who stayed away and didn't vote for either candidate. They need to get some of those people back in 2018. And people want to focus on toppling Trump in 2020. They, they have to kind of remember that before you get to all the cool, sexy stuff in 2020, you have to kind of do the ugly, tedious, grueling, and uncomfortable 2018 midterms. And to that end, it's going to be on a lot of red state terrain. And having a former Kentucky governor who successfully implemented the Affordable Care Act in his state and talked about a kind of reasonable populist line against Trump. I mean, he, he talked about immigrants. He talked about refugees. But his primary push was um, as Trump as a fraud and as Trump as, you know, this plutocrat. I think it was some pretty I think it was some pretty sound politics right there. 